Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me Niall Murphy and I'm doing this one on the 6th of September 2024 and what I would like to talk about today is basically um, Stockholm Syndrome that people in the UK feel towards the Labour Party and have done you know for many years. Um, I think of it as like being you know the, the Labour plantation <laughs> that's what I kind of think of it is that uh, then this is what causes people to vote for them in the first place. It's like um, in the American Democrats, you know, like uh, uh, Joe Biden said, right, that if you vote Republicans, he actually said, if you vote Republican or if you vote for Trump, you ain't black. He said that, right? So that basically means that if you're American and you want to say that you're black, you have to vote for um, the uh, for the Democrats and I've heard sort of uh, black people who don't um, buy into that as referring to um, that as the Democrat plantation which basically means you know that if you're black you're obliged to um, you know have to say vote socialist and um, you're, you're you're trapped in a like a poverty trap based on your political paradigm now in the UK it's more about class uh, than it is about race. So, you know, in, in the UK, in my life, one of the things that I've kind of noticed is that, um, you know, when you, when you meet people who are not particularly well off and are often sick, whatever, and, you know, they're often poor, um, they think that voting Labour, you ask them why they vote Labour, and it all comes down to one thing. One thing and one thing over. One thing only, sorry. The NHS. Now, Maybe in the early days, um, you know, straight after the Second World War, when the NHS was set up, uh, it, was, um, it was to scale and it could handle what it was supposed to do and it did work. But as time's gone by, it has had problems being able to scale up with the demands as we've gone into the modern world and um, has become somewhat of a disaster, especially in the aftermath of the COVID. But um, the thing is, you ask anyone, you know, um, why do you like Labour? They'll always come back to that, the NHS. Now, yeah, I mean, I know a few people who um, depend on them and, you know, fair enough, I'm not saying that they're wrong or anything, but the trouble is it does stop you being able to look at all the other issues that happen with the Labour Party, you know, in the UK and how the class paradigm is. You know, the general consensus is that if you're not, um, you know, that if, you're, if a lot of your mates are poor or if a lot of your mates are sick, or if a lot of your mates are, you know, how can I say, struggling, and you say, I'm going to vote Conservative to keep the Labour Party out, they won't talk to you, they'll just ostracise you. You're not my friend anymore, they'll say, right? So there's that kind of pressure, and has been for many years in the UK, to vote Labour for that reason. But the trouble is, um, a lot of people have not been them zooming out and looking at the other problems that they cause. Right, so um, now we're finding ourselves in this situation where the chickens have come home to roost. And I realised this a while back, that if the UK was going to go full on totalitarian on steroids, the Conservatives may <laughs> drift a little bit to the left and just become Conservative in name only, and maybe they'd build the infrastructure that would create the totalitarian world but Labour would implement it. Labour would actually make it a reality. They would put it on steroids, they'd boost it and they'd make it that way. That's the conclusion I come to and it's happened. That's exactly what's happened. So um, yeah, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off uh, by pointing one thing out that I think everyone actually should be scared of right now in the UK. Before I do that, I'm going to um, show you a video, part-time, no, is it, uh, full-time raver, socialite and ging ginger growler, who also moonlights part-time as the Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner, was at a rave recently. She was larging it up in the beef, weren't she, right? And um, I saw this video, I decided that I would add my own soundtrack to it, because you know, a couple of things, right? Firstly, it was mobile phone vision, so you got this narrow, like vertical uh, video footage, I decided that I would put a couple of like, psychedelic edges on it, make it full screen and widescreen that way. And um, as I had no soundtrack to it, I decided that I needed to add a soundtrack to it, you know, make it look like, uh, so I did dark techno, right? Um, and that, that kind of created the vibe of Angela Rayner being at an illegal squat party, you know, <laughs> well, why not, you know? So anyway, here's my, uh, added soundtrack to Angela Rayner larging it up in the beefer.
I've got to be honest though, she looks like um, she looks like she's been um, you know uh, driving that 1990s model of Mitsubishi. Yeah, for those of you who know what I mean, right? She does look a bit like that. So right when the uh, when the effects of the Mitsubishis wore off so to speak, right? And she's back at work, not wearing her red dress anymore, but wearing some terrible granny dress. She gets confronted by Lee Anderson of uh, the Reform UK. So check this out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Secretary of State please explain to me and the House what the government, government's definition of Islamophobia actually is? So state. Well, I, I say to the Honourable Member that a new definition must be given careful consideration so that it comprehensively reflects multiple perspectives and considers potential implications for different communities. And we're actively considering our approach to Islamophobia, including definitions, and we'll provide further updates on this in due course. I had to add those speech balloons to Nigel Farage and to Lee Anderson, I thought, you know, because I was just thinking, that's what they're thinking, but that's probably what the whole country's thinking at the moment as well, isn't it, you know? So, yeah, this is a bit of a worrying thing, a worrying trend, right, is that, um, you know, Labour being socialist and being, you know, as I say, becoming full-on communist the way they are now, historically, this is what they do. They pretend to be nice, they pretend to be virtuous, they hide behind good deeds, while at the same time creating an enemy. Right? Now, the enemy, um, if you go back to like, Stalinist Russia, uh, the enemy was the, uh, the bourgeoisie. They said, we've got to get rid of all the rich because they're stealing from everyone and the workers of the world must unite. Right? And so that's um, how communism worked back in those days. And so uh, this resulted in the end, meaning that the only people who had anything more than everyone else in Russia were the kulaks. Um, I think it was actually in Ukraine. You see, it was the breadbasket of um, the Soviet Union. It, uh, it was the westernmost point of the Soviet Union. And it was great for agriculture because it had a climate and land not too dissimilar to what you would find in Western Europe and the UK. So it was ideal for growing wheat, ideal for growing crops, great agricultural land. It was pretty much the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. And of course, um, the kulaks were the farmers there. The trouble is, of course, is that um, everyone decided they didn't like the kulaks anymore because now they killed off the bourgeoisie, the kulaks were the bourgeoisie. So what did they do? They stuck the kulaks in the gulags. And this resulted in mass starvation and famine because no one knew how to farm the land. No one had the knowledge base. No one had the skill set. And this caused ugh, God knows how many people who didn't um, you know, die of other means to die of starvation. And of course, you know, Chairman Mao did the same thing with his Great Leap Forward, which greatly backwards, you know, by uh, farmers were told to shoot sparrows. So they shot all the sparrows and then uh, there was no predators to keep the locusts out from stripping and picking clean all the agricultural fields. And this is what happened there. And, um, you know, so, uh, so this is the situation that we have in the UK at the moment, is there has to be uh, an oppressed class. Now, as, uh, you know, the communists found out, you couldn't convince the workers and the working class people of the Western world to become communists or socialists and workers of the world unite, solidarity comrades and all of that, because they actually didn't buy it because they were doing well with the free market system, thank you very much, and they were able to you know, aspire to be better things. They didn't actually feel particularly oppressed or any of that. So um, they couldn't make the workers of the Western world rise up and join the communist bloc yeah, you know, to fill out Marx's utopia it didn't work. So they had to do this long march through the institutions and they had to work out, all right, how can we redefine this? So then they mix that with, um, you know, race-related politics, they mix that with a bit of post-modernism, throw a bit of a George Orwell's 1984, a bit of Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World in there as well. And um, so this is what they've created. We have um, a new Britain, of course, now, which has the left-leaning champagne socialists, the middle classes, who've completely bought into the, uh, that idea, right? You th you'd want the aspiring middle classes and upper classes to be somewhat free market and capitalist so they can aspire to be better. You'd want to be able to put the entrepreneurs, you know, and help them become better and help a private enterprise create an environment that allows entrepreneurs to create wealth to create business and to create jobs 
But Labour don't seem to have any um, concept of that whatsoever. They're, um, you know, all they're about is uh, taxing and fining and creating a bigger and bigger and bigger state, nannying you and, um, you know, and policing and micromanaging every single part of you. And I know that the, I know that the Conservatives have done that, but Labour are far worse when it, when it comes to stuff like this. And they pretty much always have been, you know. So, you know, uh, as a result of that, we now have this situation where the present day equivalent of the bourgeoisie, the enemy of the state, is now the white working class, and particularly the male um, white working class, and particularly the heterosexual male white working class, who are now all dismissed and written off as far right. So everyone who doesn't, isn't in you know, lockstep with everything that these socialist mentalists that we have running the country now are all far right. You see, and that's the trouble, right? And the middle classes have been sold champagne socialism. And today's equivalent of the proletariat in the UK are all the, uh, what I want to say, all the oppressed groups. Man, they started off as women, but women are not quite oppressed enough, so they're quite low on the level of intersectionality. And um, while the ones who are trans exclusionary, they're, they're not part of that. Then you've got the gay men, of course, who are a little bit on the level of uh, intersectionality, but they're quite low down. And of course, conservative gay men like uh, Douglas Murray are phew, persona non grata. So there's that, right? And then, of course, you know, you have all the ethnic groups and you have all the different religions and then you've got the trans thing and you've got, I don't know, you've got all of these intersectionalities that have kind of come over from America, wokeness, which has come from America, which actually was propagated as an idea by um, French academics, made it to America, got reinvented as a form of American Marxism and has now come over in this new globalised world uh, so that the, uh, the new oppressed masses are the um, ethnic minorities and, and uh, sexual minorities and all these other people, subcultural groups, because they couldn't get the white working classes to buy into the idea of solidarity comrades, workers of the world unite comrades, because they couldn't get them to buy into that. They've now said that they're fascists and hard right, they're Nazis, basically an, a totalitarian um, system comes in, totalitarian paradigm comes in. If there's any group of people you don't want them, you accuse them of being the opposite type of totalitarian. Oldest trick in the book, right? It doesn't really matter whether you have, at this point, a communist or a fascist totalitarian system. They will manifest themselves in different ways, yeah? But the end result will be the same. That's the thing. Total state control, total hegemonic domination, no freedom of speech, systems um, you know, coercing your conformity, forcing your compliance, all of that, and everyone's scared. And that's basically what it is. It doesn't matter who does this or what does this. But, you know, as I say, one thing um, that does, uh, for me, make the Labour Party worse than anything else is the fact that they were destined to do this. They were absolutely destined to do this. I mean, you know, you can see from all the conferences that led up recently to before the Labour Party got in. I mean, I played clips in previous videos where we're all going, solidarity comrades, and someone else is calling them comrades, 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 you know, you've seen that. And um, that's, that's done the rounds and it's made its way around there. So we know that, um, you know, we have hard left organisations like, you know, socialist worker, hope not hate, people like that. Um, you know, pretty much pointing a gun at the head of the cabinet. We also know that we have, um, you know, organisations to do with like minorities. I mean, Islam is a good example. The Muslim Council of Great Britain, who are suggesting um, bringing in this new law that um, you know Angela Rayner was um, quizzed on the, uh, you know, the Islamophobia law. Now, if that gets in, that's going to be pretty dangerous, and I tell you why. First, I'm going to show you a press release. This is actually from the newspaper from The Times, where Sikhs, the Sikh community of Britain, are actually trying to resist this and are trying to um, help stop this from coming in. So I won't read the whole thing out. What I'll do is I'll show you a uh, screenshot. Now, you can pause it or you can screenshot it yourself and then, um, you know, read that in your own time. But, uh, yeah, so what I was going to say is that... Um, any criticism, basically, or any sort of referring, any politically incorrect view or any stereotypical view of anything, anyone speaks about this in the UK, they want to make it illegal to um, you know, criticise them in any way. Now, 
My attitude is, right, if you're going to do that, do it to all religions or no religions. Simple as, right? Now, the UK, right, the way it's set up, as far as I know, is a theocracy. And what is the religion of the theocracy? It's Christian Protestantism, the Church of England. Now, right, I might not be um, Christian myself. Um, you know, I might be agnostic. But I have got used to the fact that, um, you know, the UK is a, um, a country where the institution, the main religious institution that runs everything, is a Protestant Christian organisation. And the king is, the, is basically the head of that church and is also the head of state. But, and I thought, I thought originally that, you know, one of the reasons why I'd be reluctant about the idea of Britain becoming a republic was that I thought that this institution of archaic anachronistic monarchy, which of course I'm not really all that happy about, galvanised, um, you know, the king being the head of the church and the church being the dominant, uh, you know, religion, stopping anything from changing it. I now think that, like, they're powerless and I think that this isn't going to be the case anymore. And the direction of travel, if you look at whatever demographics that you have in the UK, who are the fastest growing um, out of all the religions and all the demographics and who are the fastest reproducing? You can see the direction of travel and what it is. Now, you know, what does this mean? It means that Labour just want to take lots of freedoms away and they're doing all sorts of things, that, but they all contradict each other. Like, for instance, right, they want to bring in this um, law to make it so that you cannot criticise Islam. If you do criticise Islam, then you could go to prison. Well, what happens then if apostates who've left the religion, um, who will spend the rest of their life being scared that they're going to be killed for the crime of not being a Muslim anymore, haven't got a voice? What happens to them? They can't go to anyone. What happens to, um, you know, girls who have been in grooming gangs, what happens to them if they can't speak, you know? Uh, because you could end up in a situation where, you know, that someone like, I mean, a good example is um, Samantha Smith, who was on Mark Stein's show. Um, and, um, you know, this is a picture of Samantha Smith. And um, she ended up uh, being, I don't know what she is now, she's a sort of like writer, a journalist, or something like that, but uh, activist. Um, and she, uh, has joined some conservative movements, but when she was younger, she was, you know, basically at the behest of grooming gangs. She spoke out about that a lot. She went on Mark Stein's show, spoke out about her experiences, and then the police come to her door for appearing on Mark Stein's show on GB News. I think this was a couple of years ago now, right? So, um, people like her, there's also a few other people who are ex-Muslims who stopped being Muslims. I think there's, uh, there's also Ayan Hirsi Ali, now, I don't know if you know who she is. She's Somali. She um, escaped Somali, escaped the tyranny of that religion, ended up in the Netherlands, learned to speak Dutch, then learned to speak English, then moved to America, then married um, the, the Professor Neil Ferguson, not the bad one from Imperial College, the good one with the, with, who spells his name Niall, who's basically got the same name as me, the Scottish man, but he calls himself Neil Ferguson, uh, the historian who's in the uh, United States. She married him. Uh, she went through being an atheist, then she became a Christian. But the fact is that, like, um, her criticisms are justified because of what she had experienced. The same with Samantha Smith as well. And they are at risk of being imprisoned for, their, for, you know, for basically espousing their views, in which case they would be justified for doing so. Yeah. This is pretty bad. And then, of course, there's, um, hmm, what's her name? Uh, Yvette Cooper, Mrs. Balls, the Home Secretary, uh, talking about wanting to bring in an extreme misogyny rule. Well, that's going to be that's going to conflict with the, you know, with the uh, Islamophobia rule, because it's quite obvious that women are a lot of the time not treated very fairly, and that's an understatement in that religion. And what happens if uh, women speak out against that? What happens if women who were ex-Muslims speak out against that, you know, and complain that there's misogyny in Islam, then are they going to get in trouble for being Islamophobic? And will the, um, the, the extreme misogyny rule, which should apply to the person who hit them, right, not be applied to them? It does seem very two-tier to me. And it makes me kind of think that who's, got, who's pointing a gun to the head of Keir Starmer and the Labour cabinet right now 
You know, you kind of get the impression that a lot of these people with bad agendas, whether it be militant Islamists who have actually threatened to kill Labour politicians, I mean, they have, and as a matter of public record, it's not a lie. It happened, um, I think there was some controversy of the old Mr. Speaker, who, uh, you, know, um, you know, just earlier this year in the House of Commons. I mean, that's pretty worrying, right? So, you know, you've got that, you've got people like Hope, Hope Not Hate, the hard lefties, who seem to be able to spread misinformation and fake news without, with total impunity, where people do it from the other side, they go to prison. So, I'm looking at the UK and I'm thinking, you know, this is the mess that Labour are creating. Now, these are not the only messes that Labour are creating. As they make the state bigger, basically, which is what they're doing, and as they just waste and waste and waste money, um, while at the same time there's a mass exodus of millionaires leaving the UK, people who could stay there and actually generate wealth, generate jobs, do a lot of good startups, are leaving in droves. I think the UK must be losing people with net worths of billions every year um, as a result of this, and it's just, phew, right? they're all going to go. So, um, you know, the, the thing is that like um, people are losing confidence in the UK, people with uh, money who could bring wealth are losing confidence. People who wish to, you know, who are pro-free speech are losing confidence in that country. And um, that's what's going to happen, what people are going to leave. And, um, pff, uh, I mean, it's inevitable that this is going to happen. And then what? You've got the problem of the unions. The unions have always had their guns at the head of Labour. You know, I remember this uh, speech, I saw this speech that Kamala Harris was making in America saying, strong unions make a strong America. And I had to um, leave a comment saying, no, they don't. Last time we had strong unions in the UK, they brought Britain to its knees. You know, America, you'll be next uh, if you uh, vote her in. And that's what strong unions do. They just become militant. They just want more and more and more money. So what happens is that you basically, um, you know, a lot, of these, um, a lot of these are public services as well. So, you know, you end up with trained drivers and doctors and, you know, a variety of other people with strong unions getting paid more and more while everyone else suffers, right? And I was making this joke about why don't they just pay the train drivers to work from home? seeing as no one will be able to afford a ticket, they don't need to flip and drive the train, because that's the direction it's going to go in as well. So, yeah, this is the uh, problem. You know, all this stuff about fairness and social justice and all this stuff about equality, it don't mean shit. And, um, you know, I, I prefer my enemies to just be, honestly, just come up to me and go, I don't like you, I'm going to kill you. Pfft. Right. That's what I prefer my enemies to do. I don't like my enemies to come up to me and tell me, oh, that they, they care for me, they care for my rights and all of that. And then I, I find out a little bit later that they've stabbed me in the back. You know, because that's what you're dealing with, with um, the Labour Party. And um, I remember recently when Academic Agent, who was a friend of uh, the Lotus Eaters, he was doing this um, campaign, Zero Seats for the Tories. I don't know why he doesn't do a zero seats campaign for Labour because I honestly think that if there is going to be any hope um, in the future for the UK, right, that the Labour Party needs to be just wiped from Parliament. The Labour Party should have zero seats and there should be no one from that party in there. None, no one at all. I think the best thing that anyone could do, now I'm not suggesting that you go against the establishment. What I'm saying is that there's pro-establishment rhetoric. You have democracy, you have voting, you have polls, you have all this stuff. And all people have to do is make sure that they vote in a way that will mean that Labour, at best, comes second in any seat. And as a result, have no seats in Parliament. Now, I know that's a tall order, and I know that's not going to happen, unfortunately. But... You know, as I say, there is nothing worse than, you know, the, the, the types of people who uh, use what you would call it a malicious altruism. The people who pretend to care while they're shafting you, right? And this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, I often say to people, you know where you stand with Nazis, you know where you stand with the far right totalitarian system. They don't sugarcoat it. And if anything, far-right totalitarianism is actually easier to avoid because um, you know where you stand, they're very, very honest about it. Whereas far-left totalitarianism is actually more dangerous 
because it's harder to tell when the left has gone off track than when the right has gone off track. And it's um, very easy to be taken in and seduced by all the promises of fairness and equality and social justice. They deliver none of it. None of them have ever delivered any of it. And as I would say about you know, the Conservatives, well, this is the thing that I often said about um, the UK, is that you know, you know the Conservatives are a bunch of nasty bastards. You know they are. They're not pretending they're not a lot of the time. Um, and if they do, they don't pretend as hard as Labour does. But Labour pretend to be the saviours of the common man and the poor person and the downtrodden and the disenfranchised and how they want to bring equality. And so they're very good at talking people out of believing that they're a nasty, malevolent, you know, evil, you know, Machiavellian, psychopathic scum. They're very good at talking people out of believing that. And this is what you end up with, you know? Is, can Britain be saved at this point? Well, if you ask me, I don't think it can. I think it's too late now. I would say that if Britain was the Titanic, uh, we're past the breaking in half, we're, half, we're past the uh, electric lights going out, and we're now at that bit where it's going down vertically, and all those people who are holding on to the top of the port side, you know, they've lost all hope that they're going to stay alive. That's the state I think it is in at the moment. And, um, you know, I don't see, you know, I don't see any hope for it at all. It's a shame. I don't hate it. I loved the countryside when I was there. I loved being in Devon, you know. I'm glad I escaped London. I always loved the West Country, you know. So I don't hate it as an archipelago of islands in nature, in the world. But I really hate what the political classes have done to it. I hate what it has become. It's just absolutely terrible when you think of what they have done. Now, I'm not against the people who want to stay and fight. If you're the sort of person who wants to stay and fight and make it a better place, then good. You know, I've pretty much given up on it myself. We shouldn't fall out over it. They shouldn't call me a coward for not being there. And I shouldn't call them, um, you know, idiots with Stockholm Syndrome for wanting to stay there and fight. No, we shouldn't have that division. We shouldn't be polarised like that, you know? Because um, you can look back in history and think, well, were, were the Jews in Germany cowards for leaving Germany? You know, in the 1930s, before the 1940s? And from this um, part of history now, looking back, we can see they're still alive. So, you know, maybe they did the right thing after all by, um, by leaving. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the way I'm looking at it at the moment. We really don't know what the future is going to hold. And it could be that, yeah, if some people want to stay and fight, well, there will always be people who want to stay and fight. And good luck to you if you do. But, you know, being, I don't know, even though I call myself an atypical anywhere, you see, I've got no problem with national boundaries, I've got no problem with cultures um, wanting nationalism in their own countries, wanting to be, uh, you know, preserve what they have. It's much more like that here in the Philippines, and this has got nothing to do with racism on my part, because I'm the only white I know at the moment, right? Everyone here is a different race to me. And I've got used to that, they like me, I like them, it's okay. Um, but they have a sense of who they are. Um, they, uh, as I say, they're breeding at above replacement rates. They're, they have sort of a cohesive culture, something that's holding them together. The economy is booming. It's kind of like a place that is pulling itself out of the third world, not into the third world, so to speak, right? And um, so, you know, and I, I don't really want that to change. And, you know, like I say, There'll be a lot of people saying, oh, aren't you hypocritical now? Yeah, you don't, if you think immigration's bad for England, why are you, why did you leave? I had no problem with immigration the way it was before, when it was 30,000 people a year, when it was people from ex-British colonies who had assimilated. I had no problem with the way it was before. I just have my problems with the way it's being managed, the way Europe appears to be being swamped and flooded, the way this all seems to be collusion between NGOs and globalists and people like that. There is something very sinister about the way it is being done. And it's like as if it's been deliberately done for not good reason, right? Whereas um, that's not happening here, you know? You're just getting a few like expats marrying the locals, right? That's not the same. No one would have a problem, would they, of an English person marrying a foreigner in England, 
No one would have a problem with that. No one ever has a problem with that. Well, I never had a problem with that. Someone meets someone who's foreign and they want to marry them and bring them over to live with them. Then, do you know what I mean? The sort of thing is, they've, they've got 50% foot in the UK culture. Their kids are half English. Assimilation is inevitable, if not straight away from the first generation and certainly from the second generation. It doesn't create parallel societies that exist outside and therefore outside the law because of a two-tier system. That, from what I can tell, is not happening here. I wouldn't want that to happen here anyway, you know. So that's basically my message there. Uh, I don't want to live in a world where everywhere you go it's the same. Everywhere looks like Croydon and everyone is the same mishmash of United Station assorted United Colours of Benetton. But that's what they're turning Europe into. It would mean that there really would be nowhere to go because the whole world would become a globalist dystopia. So I've just basically repositioned myself in a part of the world that isn't the globalist dystopia. And, you know, if the world is going in that direction and globalism is eroding and rotting away at cultures like this and we are going to end up scattering ourselves across the world, well, I'm part resigned to the, the fact that this is the way things are going. And um, I just think that, like, yeah, we all got to work this out for ourselves. As I say, it's your model. It's your reality model. You model it as you wish. Um, we don't know who's right and wrong in a situation like this, but I cannot stay in a country that's been governed by those morons, those cacistocrats, those um, you know second-rate middle managers, these short-sighted um, midwits with such levels of rigidity of mind that they cannot see the people who don't take responsibility for their own stupidity, think they're better than us assert themselves above us like we are useless eaters. I can't be in an environment like that. I find it really insulting to my intelligence and my dignity as a sovereign entity. And um, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't stay there. I, I would just be absolutely outraged all the time. So anyway, enough of my waffling, yakking. My ranty videos are getting longer, aren't they? Hey. Anyway, before I go, I've ordered a green screen, right, um, that I can put behind me. I decided that I want to be able to do more videos from indoors, right? Uh, because, well, going out uh, here, um, it's always hot and the sun is always really, really, really powerful here, you know? Except at winter solstice when the sun is as low as it is in late May in England. You know, apart from that, the rest of the time, um, the sun is really brutal. Going out for walks and talks in, a, in, in an environment like this is not actually very easy for a whitey like me who's not native to this part of the world so uh, I thought I'd get myself a uh, green screen and I can do all sorts of things put all sorts of backgrounds behind me and even I can even do a few comedy sketches with it as well you know so there's that as well so uh, anyway I'm going to um, leave you to it um, see you later alligator see you soon baboon if you like this content don't forget to like subscribe and share and while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.